So let's may, uh, try to welcome uh, John from Force Rock. Uh, he is the principal solution architect, and uh, he will be talking about the digital native list and wants from the financial service provider perspective. So um, yeah, hello, John. So uh, I can see so uh, in the screen. Can you say a few words and then make sure that um, there's, the voice is not here? Absolutely. Uh, thank, thank you, Patrick. I hope you can hear me all okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So I, I pass the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining. And uh, I'm going to do a short presentation on uh, what I call sort of what the digital natives needs and want from uh, financial services providers uh, may be these days. So what, um, what um, I thought I'd start this off with is that financial services is, is changing, right? We have new generations coming online and they have different expectations on how they want to uh, connect and engage and interact and use financial services as such. And I think there are a couple of things that are really, really interesting from a development point of view that's happening today and that are enabled by means of a good, secure use of APIs, etc. So, um, and for Hong Kong, I, I'm delighted to see that we have, uh, you know, digital virtual banks uh, sprouting up with the, uh, obviously with the HKMA's uh, guidance and, uh, and, uh, and support. So having those digital native brands, even if they're coming from uh, existing banking brands, but they really re-innovate themselves as pure digital end-to-end -end offerings. That is really amazing and, and, uh, and uh, 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 makes me pleased to see that happening. And, and, and the reason I get so pleased by that is that no digital interaction in a financial services setting uh, is really possible without having a digital identity foundation uh, behind it. We need that for uh, to establish trust. We need that to address compliance um, and regulation requirements. But also, it's the fundamental tenant for a convenient, hyper-personalized uh, service offering to your um, uh, to the user base. And APIs play a a, a critical role in this um, uh, environment uh, in the sense that, as I will, will highlight in a little while, it connects a range of stakeholders together. It also, obviously, is what exposes the services that your, your consumers will consume. But importantly, it is also the, the mechanism where digital identity, where uh, consent and uh, authorizations, authentication and biometric modes of, of interactions are in a way funneled through. And, and that will be my, my uh, main thrust of um, uh, uh, discussion today. And, and I just want to, to, to acknowledge also that uh, I may refer to the term uh, uh, digital native as the title of the call, as well as digital immigrant. You may have heard this as something that uh, Mark Prensky uh, coined maybe some 10, 15 years ago. Uh, he's an educator that really looked at uh, what does this trans generational transition mean for, for businesses and especially in his case, uh, education. So, so we are at some interesting crossroads today with, uh, with digital being the first choice for many. We have technologies that enable it from communication technologies like 5G is sort of really accelerating the uh, infrastructure for digital interactions. Uh, we have um, uh, regulators accepting things like EKYC and um, remote presence for account openings, so on and so forth. So it's, it, it's, it's an exciting time to, to be in APIs and also to uh, work in the digital identity uh, space. But it's also a, a challenge because we do have 
new expectations from, from our users on basic and critical services such as, as financial and, and banking services. So what I uh, am going to, to um, uh, talk about and, and try to pull together how, how, how those needs from the individuals as well as from the businesses how that sort of um, impacts and is uh, uh, is possible to to support and implement uh, with um, with some technologies um, uh, etc. So so firstly, um, if you look at the individual, so you and me, we we tend to even if I'm of, of probably a, a older generation, we we tend to look today for instant gratification. I want to do something now and I want to be able to do it right now. I don't want to have cumbersome application processes, onboarding processes, etc. So to meet that need, we, we do have the, the requirement, especially in, in financial services, to do real-time onboarding. That is what you want to give your customers but you also need to comply. And that means being able to do an electronic KYC um, uh, 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 check as well. Uh, I hope you can see the slide. I got some, some feedback here on the chat that it's hidden. So I'll just assume we can see that one. Uh, Patrick, let me know if that's not the, the case. Hmm. All right, let me do this again. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was able to see your, uh, your slide, but you, you, it seems that you hired uh, during the, the talk. So I guess it's okay now. So, All right, is it, is it back now? Yeah, it's back now, okay. Uh, okay, so, so I may have inadvertently just gone down and touched that stop sharing type of slide. So, so uh, hopefully you heard my, my uh, verbal, verbal um, uh, uh, commentary. So, Instant gratification, uh, technology for real-time onboarding and eKYC is critical. Then, as a, as a user, we also want the convenience, but we want the security as well uh, in how I interact with the bank services and at different uh, touch points. So the mobile application, typically, web application, even call centers and kiosks, which, which some virtual banks are, are, are using as well, uh, or in branch for, for um, uh, services where that's relevant. So from a, a, um, a bank point of view, you want to facilitate this hyper-personalization of the, uh, the user journeys. Uh, allow a group of users and individual users really to get what they need in a way, shape, and form they want to consume it. And from a security point of view, um, I am a, a pretty strong advocate of that using a device aware biometric capabilities or so things on Apple like Face ID and, and similar type of sensors is a fundamental, again, building block to take friction out of the engagement and yet have a secure interaction uh, environments. The third point, and there are really many points that we could talk about, but the third point is that, uh, that uh, uh, we want to provide information that is contextually relevant for the interaction that we are trying to do. So it is a bad practice to ask for a broad range of data up front just in case it's needed later on. Personally, I when I get asked, you know, if you sign up for a newsletter of some sort or you join a site and you have the 62 different, um, uh, you know, attributes to provide, I either make them up because I can't be bothered to think it through and uh, more importantly, I may, may not want to provide that because I don't understand it, how it's going to get used. I can't control my data, if you wish. So from a bank point of view or a financial services provider, uh, it is best practice to do progressive profiling, to ask for data 
as it's required and when it's needed and also allow the user to control and manage that in a self-service fashion. That means revoking, it means updating, it means changing. And I touch on that from a regulatory uh, point of view a little bit later as well. And when you get presented as a user, just like we see when we sign up with a, a application, it, it, it may prompt me to say that uh, this application wants to use your email, phone number, your all your photos and all your files, etc. Do you agree to that, right? And that can be made really granular and I think it needs to be and it needs to be understandable. So the user should always have the choice. I want to share this, but not that. And then the service provider, the bank in this case, may need to adjust and say, uh, Johan didn't consent for, uh, for, for A. Therefore, I may have to reduce the service a little bit because I don't have the, the, the customer's explicit consent. So you need that uh, 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 good use of the consent collected in how you deliver the services and always be prepared that the user may revoke consent. Then what do you do, right? So the couple of, of new waves of thinking around privacy first and data minimization that I think needs to be upfront when you design services and the associated um, APIs. All right, uh, let's see here. It went off again, unfortunately. So we do it like that. And um, so hope it, it's it's back here. It seems to go when I I progress my slide, but never mind. We we, we deal with that. So when uh, when uh, uh, we look at the users, they, they get influences. They interact with what I call uh, digital, you know, consumer lifestyle platforms. Let them be social sites, uh, 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 you know, fashion sites, sporting sites, media sites, etc. And they get influenced from them how they expect the user experience and a journey to be smooth, quick, efficient, uh, reduced friction. So that is what's forming a mindset that we need to lift in to the uh, uh, what are sometimes referred to as the global and local ecosystem platforms that, that, that underpins our uh, financial services, that underpins banking. Um, we need to be influenced from the, the more consumer leisurely orientated platform and take the best modes of interaction, the best practices for engagement from them and putting them into a, a, a context that is secure from a financial services point of view that is compliant with regulators and still giving the user that the feel of that they are the, the audience of, of one. It's a hyper-personalized engagement that they are getting and it is secure because we talk about uh, uh, financial services type of, of, of APIs. Um, and uh, and uh, what, what ties it together, obviously, is uh, is uh, APIs. So APIs tie together the, the the stakeholders in the digital services realm today. And um, uh, APIs are, as as and I'm preaching to the converted here, I'm sure they cannot be seen as something that is static. It is something that continuously uh, need to evolve and change. And a lot of that change, the, the driver for the change is happening out of the consumer's expectations. So if we look at the ones we're trying to serve and, and sell to, we, we, we need to be aware of how do they want to interact? Uh, how, how much reduced friction do they require for a service? Uh, how can they best utilize capabilities they have on the preferred device that they're using to interact with you? So we need to continuously uh, adjust and, uh, and uh, enhance the APIs and how they are offered into the, um, into the ecosystem, including factoring in constructs, and I'll talk about this in a little while as well, and constructs that facilitate uh, consent, privacy, 
uh, uh, out of band authentication, so on and so forth. All of that becomes the, the um, uh, in a way, the design center for a, uh, a, an ecosystem for, for your customers, the, the banks, the fintechs, and the regulators, where we have a you know, trustworthy and happy uh, type of, uh, of, of relationship. So moving on and, and looking at it from a, a digital native service provider's point of view, and using the, the, the four sort of coarse grain areas that, um, that I was uh, highlighting earlier, onboarding, personalization, uh, user managed control, uh, consent collection and administration, there are a couple of things that, that, that come into play and you need to be aware of them. And, and I'm sure most of you are, uh, is around the uh, regulation. So, in financial services, uh, especially, there are some strong regulations that you need to comply with. And I used a couple of examples here. So we have the uh, AMLO, so the anti-money laundering um, uh, ordinance in Hong Kong, for example, that, that uh, describes how you can onboard customers, how you should EKYC them, etc. That is just simply something that your APIs uh, need to be able to deal with. Uh, same when it comes to uh, personal data and, uh, and privacy ordinance in Hong Kong again. So, uh, you know, uh, you have GDPR and we have CDR and lots of others as well. There is regulation that dictates how, how things must be done. You need to comply and uh, that needs to be factored in when you design your services and the, the associated APIs. Now, I often have the view that uh, that compliance is, is just something you have to do. It's the cost of doing business. But going over and beyond that, making the compliance-related uh, non-negotiable requirements you have to deal with, turning them around and making them into something that is a positive experience for the user, that is really where you want to focus your, your thought processes and, 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 and looking at it, okay, we have to do this from a compliance point of view. How do we make that? Uh, easy to use and uh, in a way delightful for the user. Ah, oh, you know, we, we collect private information. Oh, let's have a simple way for the user to change it and, uh, and uh, see how it's being used, with whom it's been shared, etc. If we do that, I, I think the consumers, the customers will like us. The regulators will see that we take the spirit of regulation and uh, and complying, but also enhancing. So, so I think that is is an important aspect of the um, uh, design cycle. So, so when we look at getting into the more technology space here, so there, there's some technologies that um, that uh, are relevant for uh, open banking, for financial services in general, for, for really for any sensible um, or sensitive uh, service and, and API interaction that you have there is um, for the onboarding and EKYC. And we all heard and seen the, uh, the uh, issues around deep fakes and, uh, and uh, presenting uh, you know, photos and videos and, and uh, trying to fool the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, identity verification and identity matching and, and that onboarding process. So, so we need things like liveliness detection. When you look for something to do EKYC and people enroll with, uh, with uh, photographic IDs, let's say you don't have a electronic national ID at hand, uh, how do you detect that it's a real person there? How do you match that with, uh, with uh, the you know, authoritative uh, uh, database that has uh, you know, a passport or a driver's license, etc., doing the facial extraction, the facial recognition? Those are things you need to get right. Um, then there are also some, some ISOs, so uh, International Standards Organization, they specify a whole Bible of, uh, 
of API uh, uh, reference information, best practices that they collate around collecting and using human biometric data. And then we have the, the, the slightly more that we all interact with day to day, uh, things around uh, uh, OIDC and uh, OAuth2 from a uh, user managed access point of view, from a financial API point of view, gathering uh, consent from the user, having the user authorizing the, the um, access that the third party is, is requesting, etc. There are technologies out there today that, that we can put to, to very, very good use. And uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar, obviously, with the uh, OIDC and O of two flows, so, so what we typically see in, in the financial API setting is using OIDC hybrid flows, using the SIBA flow, so which is the client-initiated back-channel authentication flow to, to get that uh, user strongly authenticate and consent to what typically a third party is requesting and also being able to revoke that down the track. And, and recent um, additions with web authentication supported across a much broader range of um, devices with, with Apple joining the party. Uh, so you can use five to two authenticators natively, so on and so forth. All of that helps with the, with the simplification and yet the improved security of the interactions for a financial service ecosystem. And, and also the uh, on the onboarding side that I mentioned, detecting deep fakes, etc. All of that being able to 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 do what's called um, a presentation attack detection. So that's around liveliness, etc. Is is really really uh, important. And and just as a final plug from from a Fortran point of view, is that we recognize this um, complicated environment. We recognize the need for being able to quickly, dynamically integrate a, a range of technologies and uh, to, to, to come up with those journeys that the users uh, want to see. They want simplicity and security. And uh, we want to make sure that those journeys can be orchestrated, deployed and used for providing access to your um, uh, services. So, so that is uh, all I wanted to... You can have the full screen of your face, so you can, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, so you, you mentioned about the granularity, that uh, the different kind of uh, authentication, et cetera, uh, that can fit the digital native expectation. But um, I, I do also have experience that uh, some of the reason that uh, they cannot do that is due to the capacity, or maybe there are some system already well at the average. So do you have any uh, quick suggestion how those uh, maybe legacy system or, or those uh, adapted system, how to progressively uh, yeah. adapt the, 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 the model or the, the thing that you, you propose here? Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, we never have the luxury of starting green field, right? So we can't decide. Well, actually, some do. Some of the virtual <laughs> yeah. yeah, green yeah, yeah. field. They're in a lucky position. If you are not, you need to find a way to put, I tend to call them software chins yeah. in, in front of those legacy applications that will allow them to be modernized so they can do a biometric authentication. And then you have to do some dancing and integration on the southbound side of that to, to make that legacy system accept that new style of, of authenticator without, and this is a requirement we often see, without any or too much core changes to the system. So I tend to wrap it up in, in this saying that if you have, if you can, and most times you can, refactor your authentication and authorization approach and try to get as much as possible uh, of that into your digital identity platform and let it manage that. It can be done, it's being done, we do it, and it has some good payoffs uh, from uh, from um, a uh, a uh, solutioning uh, point of view. I hope that gave some yep. some some uh, insights into how how we think about that. Yeah, for, thanks, thanks, John. I think the time is uh, almost up. So thanks very much for your uh, for your your insight and sharing as well. So uh, yep, thanks for your time. So I will take the chance to uh, introduce the next speaker. Yep. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.